everyone. Thanks a lot for sticking around until now. I know a lot of people have left already. Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit about my ventures into this whole new DevOps thing, uh, where a whole bunch of tools have surfaced. And I'm just going to show you a little bit what I learned out of it. So if you already use Vagrant and Chef to any kind of a degree, you will probably be quite bored by this talk. So this is kind of the introductory um, get to know the players kind of thing. Um, so just a little warning. Um, short plug to Zero Turnaround, which is the company that I work for. They, they're actually here. They have a great booth. Um, we make some awesome Java products and they make it possible for me to be here. So they pay for everything, uh, even though this is not a product pitch. So a um, little advertisement for them. And who am I? I'm here at Bevin. I work as a senior software engineer. I am a Java champion. I also love doing stuff with a lot of different gesture detection mechanisms. I did a lot of things with the Leap Motion Controller. If you like that kind of stuff, you can come over still to the Hackfest tomorrow. Uh, we've got a bunch of those with us if you want to code up some gesture control th things. I'm a musician. I created a bunch of open source projects. I created a Rive framework that introduced native Java continuations and whole bunch of other stuff. Basically, I like interesting things. Um, so what we did in Zero Turnaround a little while ago is that we found that we've got these great applications, um, but we need a way to test them. And they're not simple tests. It's not just um, one little functional test that I run on, a, on an instance of an Apache machine. What I really wanted to do was to bring up an entire cluster very easily, and not a simulated cluster. I didn't want to have a cluster that was like mimicking uh, the behavior by changing ports and stuff like that. I wanted a cluster that was really running different machines. And the thing that you then typically do is, you bring up virtual machines and you've got to configure them, you've got to do the whole thing manually, um, or you keep kind of images around of the virtual machines that you can reuse, or you have dedicated machines for this. Uh, but in, in reality, this is really not that practical because it's all tied to you. It's very difficult to share all these things. Um, so this is what this talk is going to be about. It's a few of the tools that you can use to actually uh, bring an entire environment, a multi-machine environment that have specific behaviors and capabilities up um, very easily and treat them as code. So what we found was that having this easiness of bringing everything up had additional side effects. So we just looked at those technologies because they were interesting, but then we, we saw that it actually turned into something that was much more beneficial to the whole company. So obviously, we as developers, we started putting that into place to be able to have a real, real situation to uh, test the products against. But we found out that it actually could be used by the QA team also. And then we figured out that uh, since we've got a section of the company that writes a lot of uh, content about real-world usage in various domains, we found out that they could actually use the same tools. They didn't have to figure out how to set up all these infrastructures, but what they just could use was to, to use the simple commands uh, to bring up the entire cluster. Uh, the sales does the same thing. They use this to actually demo the products to the customers in a real-life situation, and they don't have to know how to do this. They just type one simple command. And this goes all the way to uh, the evangelist and even our CEO that uses this during his, during his webinar. So the entire company actually benefited from that one single approach. So since we only have 30 minutes, um, I kind of reduced this a little bit. And I'm only going to talk about three key points. First one is DevOps, uh, because this is a word that a lot of people are talking about. Um, and still a lot of people kind of have a different conception of what it is than what actually intention is. Then we'll talk about Vagrant, that allows you to do easy, easy uh, virtual, virtualization in an easy way, and Chef to do the provisioning. So DevOps, is actually all about the company. It is about figuring out the goals of your company for everyone in your organization. This is a very kind of philosophical question. It's got nothing technical attached to it. Um, it is really not about bringing developers and operations guys together. This is what usually people think of when they hear DevOps, because it's got these two words coined inside a single word. But this is actually just an example of what can happen. Um, so DevOps talks about the three ways, which was uh, described in one of the books that I'm going to mention later. And the first way is to create a fast flow of 
processes throughout the whole organization, which is what everyone thinks of typically when they think of DevOps, which is developers working together with operations guys, and they're not separated in silos, right? That's one of the things that you need to take care of. Another one is that you have to be able to go back. So developers feed the operations guys, and the operations guys have to feed back to the developers. So you create this kind of conversation that goes on between the different silos in the company. And then the third way is to actually be able to foster a suitable culture that allows everyone to experiment and to not be afraid of failure. So um, this brings your company in a kind of mindset that allows you to have very short feedback loops and to have everyone care about what is going on in the company. So if you want to know more about DevOps and what it really is, I strongly suggest you to read those two books. The first book, The Phoenix Project, I read it in the flight, uh, in, in, in the flight from the US to, to Europe. Very easy to read and wonderful book. It is, um, it's going to bring back a lot of memories for anyone that worked in, uh, in large IT companies. And the goal, ironically, is um, not about DevOps, but it was written a long time ago. So 25 years ago, it talks about the industry, uh, manufacturing industry, and they deal with exactly the same problems, and they dealt, it, dealt with it in, in, in actual factories, and they've got, had similar problems that we have in sub software development now. So just to stress that cultural aspect, which is why you want to find tools that make this easy, so you want to elim eliminate the silos, you always want to promote learning to everyone. Um, there is no such thing as a failure, and to be able to communicate and collaborate, you have to find a suitable culture in your company, right? So everyone has to figure out what that goal is for the company and be proud of it. So don't create a DevOps team, which is what some people are doing. This is totally against the whole idea because you create another silo that is going to be responsible of DevOps instead of creating these feedback loops that are going through the whole company. So that's a very short introduction to kind of set the stage. Um, and so one of the tools that is used a lot to achieve this, uh, these, this, these feedback loops that can happen very quickly and where everyone can actually very easily share ideas is the idea of virtualization, right? But we've all used virtualization. Um, I've been using VMware, I don't know how long it has been in, around, what is it, 15 years, maybe, maybe a bit less, but it's been around for ages. But it always requires you to do the same things, which is you start up a virtual machine, then you install some kind of image on it, or you, boot and you install it from a DVD image or whatnot, and then you go through all the same processes again. And every time you create a virtual machine, you have to do that. And if you want to save it, then you've got to save that image, and it takes a huge amount of space on your disk, um, and you can't really share it. It's very difficult. So what does Vagrant do? Vagrant is actually uh, a little bit like a programming language, a, sh a shell for virtual machines. It allows you to bring up virtual machines and treat them as if they're code. So it supports two main virtual machine technologies, so Oracle VirtualBox and VMware. So how does this work? It's surprisingly easy, actually. So they obviously also start from images, but they're readily share, shared images that are available uh, for download, a little bit like the Amazon uh, EC2 images, if you've ever worked with that, the AMIs. So you create a directory, you initialize it with a particular image, and then you say Vagrant up, and that's it. It's going to bring up the whole machine. It's going to do everything. It's going to set up the networking for your uh, environment. It's going to bring it up. It's going to provision it, and you will have a machine up and running in the background that you can work with. And so that is what the configuration looks like. That is the, base, the baseline that you will start working with. You basically have a Ruby script where you've got a whole bunch of, uh, of variables, and uh, you, you configure it like that to be able to configure your machine. Thanks, Johan. So you can already see this doesn't really look like a virtual machine if you look, if you look at it like that. It's really Ruby code, right? So this is where it starts getting interesting. So because everyone will say, okay, well, I can do this with any virtual machine, right? It just takes maybe a couple of clicks. I, I bring up a virtual machine and that image will install and that's it. But 
What it's really geared towards is to allow all these virtual machines to collaborate on a virtual network and to, and to integrate with the host that is running those virtual machines so that you can do, you as a developer can do meaningful operations without actually having to think about it. So one of the other commands, apart from the vagrant op command, is vagrant SSH. And what that does is it will uh, connect through SSH straight to that machine that you just created. So in two steps, you brought up a virtual machine and you're SSHing into it, and you can access everything, which is great. The next step, though, is that it will automatically set up file sharing with your host. So uh, there is this folder slash vagrant on the virtual machine that will be the directory at which you started that op command. So if you, for example, write a file to that slash vagrant directory, it will be visible on the host that you're actually running this. And this allows you to very easily experiment. If you like, want to quickly bring up something to test, a, to test a virtual machine that runs MySQL and an Apache server, and you want to, to send a PHP file to it, it's extremely easy because you just put those PHP files on your own machine, on the host, and the virtual machine will detect these files immediately, and you can just start working with it. You have to set up nothing else. You just bring it up, and that's it. And then finally, what you can do is actually, once you're finished with a virtual machine, because you can obviously do all the kind of operations that you have with any kind of virtual machine, you can install packages, you can configure it, you can, you can totally make it your own. Afterwards, you can still package it up and it becomes another ready-to-use image for someone else. And this is something that you then can share and people can, just as we had in the previous command here, where I started from the precise 32 box, people can use your box to actually bring up their virtual machine, which allows you to very easily create these baselines that everyone can work with. All right? So that's a quick example of Vagrant. So that's a quick example of Vagrant. Now, I'm going to show you exactly what I just said here. I'm going to show you how this works in, in code. So, so what I've got here is, is exactly that. I've got uh, Vagrant running in this terminal, and what I have is this file called vagrant file. So I showed you the, the, the short example, which is basically this part here in, in the beginning, right? This thing. But what this, this configuration sets up is what I mentioned in the beginning. It actually brings up, it's got configurations for nine different virtual machines. So if I type vagrant status, you can see that I've got a Tomcat cluster, and I've got two Tomcat instances, I've got a PHP cluster, and two PHP instances, and then I've got a composite cluster that's got both of these entities combined on the same virtual machine. So I've got nine machines defined here, and I've got three of them running. And how did I start them up? The only thing that I had to do was to say, okay, Vagrant up. I t told it I wanted to use VMware Fusion uh, instead of the default virtual box. And I give it the names of the virtual machines that have to come up, and boom, they start. The nice thing about this is that this is all described in this Ruby file. And it's, it's regular Ruby. You can ex extract uh, functionality, like for example, um, here, this is, this is the configuration of, a PH, of my PHP server that I want to reuse. I just extracted it into a function. It becomes code. The nature of my machine has become code. And this is then shared, in our case, for example, in, in, in a Git repo. And everyone can just check this out, types vagrant up, and has access to all the same virtual machines, which is pretty amazing, I think. So if you look through these here, um, you can see that I can have it adapt to the kind of virtual machine uh, provider that is being running. So if it's, if it's VMware Fusion, in this case, I'm going to give it a little bit more memory because it will be a 64-bit OS. Um, it's going to use different base images. In this case, it's one specific for VMware or the standard Precise32 one. And then I define the nature of the different virtual machines, basically here. And so what you do is you just provide simple Ruby instructions where you set variables. In this case, I say that I want to use a private network. They will all be, share, be able to share 
uh, uh, inside the same network and access each other's uh, virtual network interfaces. And I'm taking in a fixed IP address from above so that I know that I can uh, connect to that later on. And then I'm going to configure my provisioning. This is this part here, but, and I'm going to talk about that later. So um, if you don't know what provisioning is, provisioning is basically the step where you have your empty machine that is kind of the baseline, and you want to provision it and bring it to a stage that is more functional. So typically it is installing applications, uh, configuring the applications so that they are exactly the way that you want them to be. Um, so in this case, I'm, uh, this is provisioning Chef, but you can use Puppet or you can use even just basic shell scripts. And then if you read down, actually I'm here defining all these other machines. So this is a Tomcat 1 machine. It's the same one that you saw here, Tomcat 1, Tomcat 2. And here I'm extracting again that provisioning configuration to uh, uh, a Ruby function that actually shares that because they are basically exactly the same nodes and the only thing that changes is the IP address. So I'm passing the IP address that I want to use and the rest of the functionality will be exactly the same. And the same goes on for the PHP machine the cluster, which, by the way, so it contains a database and contains uh, a DNS server that is configured for doing round robin. Um, and it also contains an Apache server to be able to, to share some files. Um, so here I've got the PHP nature uh, machines, PHP 1 and PHP 2. And then basically it goes on like that. I just define machines in code and I've got extracted the different configurations here. Um, for specific machines. So you can see that my entire cluster is described in code that I can treat as any kind of code. Code. But let's now go to the next step, which is I brought up my virtual machines. They're running. But I don't want to work with that base image that I started them up with. I actually want to provision them with uh, other natures, with other software that is more appropriate to whatever I want to do with these machines. And one of the tools for that is Chef. Um, there's kind of this religious war going on between Chef and Puppet. They're basically the same. They've got different approaches to, to similar functionalities. Uh, they're both supported by Vagrant, so it's kind of up to you what you prefer. So just as Vagrant treats your uh, machine architecture as code, Chef treats the infrastructure inside the machines or the software as code, right? And so what we all have done is to write a bunch of shell scripts to automate what we always have to do to bring our machines up and to get it into a configuration state that is what we want it to be. Well, instead of having those shell scripts as just isolated snippets that we try to maintain but we really can't and it's very difficult to share, so what Chef does is that it provides you with a, uh, a very well-structured framework that allows you to treat these as recipes. And they're very much similar to uh, packages in a package manager, except that they go further. They allow you to really configure what is going on at the same time. So they're geared towards two purposes. You've got the recipes that contain reusable functionality, and then you've got data bags and you've got templates and stuff like that that allow you to customize um, operations that people have written for you beforehand. So they're like a little bit like um, customizable packages in a package manager. So this is an example. So um, when you create a recipe, you can say that it has to depend on other recipes. So for example, in this case, this is going to be that one of those cluster nodes. And what it has, it, it installs Apache 2. It installs the apt package manager. It's going to install uh, the database drivers for MySQL and Java. It's going to install a custom recipe that we've written, the Live Rebel standalone agent that kind of downloads what we need to be able to run it with Live Rebel. MySQL, OpenSSL, Python, and then everything needed for Selenium. So that's another thing that I forgot to mention. That particular node is actually set up so that you can run uh, uh, tests against an external Selenium node towards your virtual machine that is actually running the code. And then the other part of the recipe actually contains the, the instructions of the functionality that you want to do while you're actually installing that recipe. And this is all just very uh, almost declarative. You, you have these resources that 
are reusable pieces of functionality. So in this case, gem package will install a package from a package manager. You can include functionality from other recipes. You can, you can see that I configure here a specific Apache module. Um, I'm configuring also how Apache has to be uh, set up for this particular machine. So all this will be executed when the recipe is, uh, is running um, after the virtual machine comes up. And then, in, th in this example, I'm setting up a, a MySQL server, uh, which is usually a tedious thing to do if you want to set up specifically for you. There's a whole bunch of commands that you have to type. You have to create the schemas that you want to have. You have to create the users that you want to use. You've got to set the permissions right. Um, once you've done this a few times, it starts getting on your nerves. So you're, gonna st you're obviously going to start writing a script for this. Well, with a provisioning tool like Chef, you write these scripts in a way that everyone can actually reuse them in your company. So, so that's a short overview of Chef. Let me now show you what this looks like in real life. So as I've shown you before, I've got this Vagrant file here, right? So another thing that I have here is cookbooks, which actually contains all the Chef recipes, right? So these cookbooks here. And you can see the same ones that I mentioned before. So I've got the Apache cookbooks, and you can, these are then shared, so there is a, uh, the Chef website has a whole community that allows you to download existing cookbooks that have been written beforehand, so that you can either customize them or just reuse them and provide them the variables that you need. And let's, let's look in, uh, in, into that particular recipe that I showed in the slides. So what, happened, what, ha what I have here is this Live Rebel composite cluster node and you, you can see that this is all that it's in there. It is basically, so this is the code you just saw. Um, it sets up all the packages that I need for this node to be functional. It's got a few at the bottom that I didn't show, so it's, it includes the default installation procedures for Selenium and stuff like that. And then another thing that it has here basically, it, it replaces, it allows you to, to provide templates that replace, uh, that are expanded when they, when they arrive on the node. So in this case, it's uh, the, the Apache configuration to become a, a proper uh, proxy load balancer. Um, and so this shows another thing, the last thing that I wanted to, 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 to highlight, is that I'm, I'm deep into Chef here, right? So I've got Chef that has got Ruby uh, package, like recipe descriptions, that has got configuration. But from in there, I'm actually accessing attributes that have been set up in my um, Vagrant file, so in the description of my entire cluster. So if I go to my Vagrant file here, you can see here, this is actually what all this setup is for. So cluster nodes actually comes from that top level configuration that describes your entire cluster. So you're really able to um, customize the behavior of how the provisioning happens for your particular cluster, and then have this one file at the beginning that allows everyone to tune this. And afterwards, you basically have these machines here running, so fragrant status, oops, status, and you can access them. So I've got Vagrant composite one. I can just say, okay, Vagrant SSH composite one. And I'm SSHing into it. And this, this, is, this is just a, full, a fully functional um, Ubuntu workstation. So um, I can look at everything here, and it's, it's just a perfectly functioning, running virtual machine. And then I can access it. So this is what you're seeing here. I'm basically accessing these machines that have brought up everything automatically. Um, and then if you look, for example, here in Live Rebel, I could, for example, show you that. Um, so I'm SSH'd in there, and I can do what you can do with any virtual machine. Let's say that um, I'm, take, I'm taking down a, partic a particular service, and the service goes down here. And you can see that on my host, I, I have immediately access to that. So, um, so that makes it very easy as a developer to actually bring all these things up. And once you're done, and this is, this is actually probably my favorite part, so I don't, I don't have to worry about anything that I brought up. I don't have to be careful about, okay, which kind of configurations did I make? Do I have to be careful to save them so that the next time that I'm bringing my virtual machines up, it's going to be in the right state? No, because it was all scripted. It was all done by code. I know that the next time that I'm going to bring them up, they're actually going to be in the same state. So what I can do is I can basically say vagrant destroy. Oops. Uh, 
though I'm still in the virtual machine, sorry. <laughs> so I can say vagrant destroy. I'm for this my typing is not that good today. There you go. Vagrant destroy. And I'm forcing it. And it's gonna delete all the virtual machines. Everything's gone. It's as if nothing happened. So you clean off, you're done with whatever anything you wanted to test. And the next time around, you can just download maybe an update from GitHub, maybe a colleague of yours based on a change in your product requirements has made a change to the, uh, to the environment, to your provisioning environment, you're going to take down these updates from GitHub and you're going to type Vagrant up and it's actually going to be perfectly correct, exactly in the state that it should be based on what you're actually using. So. It was a very brief overview of these technologies. If you want to learn more about this, um, we actually uh, took the trouble of writing this up in a lot of detail in one of the reports that we do at Zero Turnaround. So we very regularly deep dive as developers into uh, specific topics that we analyze, not from a product standpoint, but really because we, as we always try out new stuff. And so this DevOps report, this is one of the reports that you can freely download, and it gives you some nice series of steps that you can uh, check out by yourself to go through uh, the whole Vagrant and Chef approach with uh, a lot more details and examples and, uh, and explanations than, than what I gave you today. So. I hope you liked it. It was not 60 minutes, it was more like 26 minutes. Um, and if you didn't, then well, check out our product that's called JRebel, which allows you as a Java developer to really save time. Go come over to our booth. Um, and if there are any questions, feel, feel free to ask them. Um, if not, then I'm done. <laughs> Just.